All right, we got five minutes for unchristian sentiments in the Psalms. Our liturgy usually edits out the more shocking bits of the Psalms. When we read the Psalms on our own, we encounter them in all their unedited glory. We find David gloating over his enemies, cursing his enemies, demanding God bring them to judgment, declaring his own righteousness and his own glory. Is this really what God wanted David to be praying? Is this really what God wants us to be praying? This is a major obstacle for a lot of people when they try to use and enjoy the Psalms. Let's deal with it in five minutes, shall we? <laughs> okay, violence against enemies. Turn to Psalm 137. Psalm 137 is the most infamous example of a violent psalm. It's a beautiful psalm describing the anguish of the Israelites during the exile in Babylon, and it's completely ruined by its ending. Look at verses 8 and 9. O daughter of Babylon, you devastator! Happy shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. <laughs> All right, let's look at this literally. Is it ever good to bash the heads of children against rocks? No. no. Then why is this here? How can we use this? Well, Babylonian infants aren't our real enemies. Who or what is our real enemy? Satan and his dominion. Satan and ourselves. Satan and his dominion. I wrote the devil and our own sins. Those are our real enemies. And Christians throughout the ages have generally read these vindictive passages as spiritual warfare passages. I'm going to let C.S. Lewis handle Psalm 137. Here we go. Uh, this is C.S. Lewis's Reflections on the Psalms. Okay. And his major theme really is unchristian sentiments in the Psalms. Pretty much got a whole book on that topic that I'm dealing with in five minutes. <laughs> I can even use the horrible passage in Psalm 137 about dashing the Babylonian babies against the stones. I know things in the inner world which are like babies. The infantile beginnings of small indulgences, small resentments, which one day become settled hatred, but which woo us and wheedle us with special pleadings, and it seems so tiny, so helpless, that in resistance we feel as though we are being cruel to animals. They begin whimpering to us, I don't ask much, but, or, I had at least hoped, or, you owe yourself some consideration. Against all such pretty infants, the deers have such winning ways, the advice of the psalm is best. Knock the little bastard's brains out. <laughs> and blessed is he who can, for it's easier said than done. But when the Psalms talk about defeating our enemies, they're not taking those passage li passages literally, at least not for our purposes. We read that as defeating sin, death, and the devil. Praying the Psalms for spiritual warfare can be very effective. David drove out demons with the Psalms, and so can we. Years ago, there was a sponsor in OCIA, a very respectable man of good judgment who'd been a Catholic all his life. And then one day he came to a few of us in OCIA and asked us to pray for him. And he told us some crazy stories about the things that were happening in his house. I don't remember most of the details, but the one that I do remember is that he dreamed he was grappling with a demon that was wrestling him. And when he woke up, the bloody claw marks were still on his back. And so he asked us to pray against the demons. What was going on in his life? Well, when he started out as a sponsor in OCIA, you know, he was doing it to uh, be with his grandchild, I believe. You know, just, you know, be here with her, accompany her through the program. But as the program went along, he had a conversion experience. He became passionate about Jesus. And he decided he was going to read the Bible start to finish. And he, I think he just about finished the first five books when all of this demon activity began. So... We all prayed for him. And while other people were praying first, I'm thinking, God, what do I pray? Give me some good words. And I started praying Psalm 68. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. 
As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before fire, let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be joyful. Let them exult before God. Let them be jubilant with joy. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides upon the clouds. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. Next week, the man came back and said that there had been no more demonic activity in his home, and that he credited Psalm 68 with driving the demons away. Mm. So, pray the Psalms for spiritual warfare. God works through them. Oh, I wrote here. So how do we handle the violent Psalms? Pray them for spiritual warfare. Pray them against our own sins. Pray them to recognize the unholy anger in our own hearts. If we start praying them going... Yeah, I'd love to do that to my enemies. That's when we know we've got a problem. <laughs> and finally, if you have zero use for those parts at the moment, skip them. Who's counting? Okay, judgment and righteousness. There are many places in the Psalms where the psalmist begs for God's judgment against his enemies and declares his own righteousness. Turn to Psalm 35. In verse 1, we see, contend, O Lord, against those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Then, in verses 23 and 24, we see, bestir yourself and awake for my right, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. For Christians, this can sound off-key. Is it kind to demand the downfall of our enemies? Is it true to assert our own righteousness? When we as Christians think of judgment, we think of the final judgment where everyone is weighed, every act sifted, and we'll see all of the good and all of the evil that every one of us have done, and every sin will come to light, and every good thing we've done will come to light. And generally, historically, Christians have thought of judgment as a fearsome thing. But that's not what David is thinking of. That's not what the psalmists are thinking of at all. We think of God's judgment as a criminal case where we're being tried. Oh, God, acquit me. The ancient Israelites thought of God's judgment as a civil case where they had been wronged. Oh, God, he hurt me. Make it right. I want damages. <laughs> That's the model that they're praying here. Think of Jesus' parable of the unjust judge. That woman in that parable is desperate for a hearing. She knows she's got a case, a good case, if only she can be heard. That's where David is coming from, especially in those years when he's running from Saul. So when the psalmists call for judgment, they're not saying, I want to be judged in everything, only this one matter. When the, judge, when the psalmists say they're righteous, they're not saying, look, I know I'm not righteous in everything, but in this one matter, I'm innocent. God vindicate me. Is there a time and place for praying these psalms? Absolutely. Anytime we need to pray, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. God, make things right. I have more on unchristian sentiments, but I think those are the two big ones. Any more unchristian sentiments in the psalms that give you problems? Anything you stumble across going, what? What's this? Reading 119, it seemed like he was more the Pharisee in the temple, uh, and then the, and then they, we might switch back to like being the the sinner in the back of the temple. But he was, you know, so much judging. You know, I've done so many great things, reward me kind of things. It kind of got old after a while. <laughs> you know, that's a good point. The I love your law, O Lord, and blessed are those who weigh as blameless who walk in the law of the Lord. That. Actually, that was my next point, so I'm just going to write on to it. Self-satisfaction. Man, I'm good. Obviously, as Christians, we think of that passage in the New Testament where you've got the, uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector, and Jesus tells us the right way to pray. We don't come before God saying, Oh, boy, God, I am in such good shape compared to all these people around me. We come before God saying, Oh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And yet... The Psalms are not always the voice of God's correction. They're not always a place to come to ask forgiveness. Very often the Psalms are the voice of his praise. Well done, good and faithful servant. Sometimes they come off as if we're praising ourselves. But think about it for a moment. These are the word of God. 
And there are times when God himself wants to praise us. We are God's children. And good children thrive on the praise of their parents. I'm thinking of eight-year-old Felix, my son, who lately has been coming up going, Mom, hug me! <laughs> Mom, did I do a good job? Mom, look at my homework! Mom, look at the dishes! Did I do a good job? Yes, you did great! Oh, what a good job! And then he'll like run off and do something else because he wants to make me happy. Oh. That really is the kind of relationship so often that a good person has with God. We want to make God happy. So, we soak up God's praise with a smile and we go do something else that's good. In the same way, we need encouragement too. Make sense? Amen. Amen. Anything else? That was a good one. S-E-L-A-H. Um, Selah. Selah. What is that? I'm so glad you picked that up. As I'm, remembering this, I'm not remembering this off the top of my head. I believe Selah is basically untranslatable, but it means a pause. It's where the music's supposed to stop, the singers are supposed to stop singing, you take a deep breath and you go, wow, ponder the wisdom of what you just heard. <laughs> That's what Selah means. All right, open up to Psalm 150. We are going to praise the Lord, the final hallelujah psalm. Hallelujah. Praise God in his holy sanctuary. Give praise in the mighty dome of heaven. Give praise for his mighty deeds. Praise him for his great majesty. Give praise with blasts upon the horn. Praise him with harp and lyre. Give praise with tambourines and dance. Praise him with flutes and strings. Give praise with crashing cymbals. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath give praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you for these classes on the Psalms. Thank you for teaching us how to praise and worship you. Give us a wonderful Holy Week and Easter, and bring us back safely in three weeks. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.